Okay, so good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar, Market Thursday. It's November the 4th, um, 8 p.m. here in London. Uh, so welcome for those of you who are joining right now. And for those of you who will be watching later on YouTube, uh, so thank you for watching. Uh, just a quick uh, disclaimer. Um, so those webinars are not investment um, advice. So this is purely for information. Uh, I do not take responsibility for losses incurred by viewers. Uh, please do your own research um, and you can uh, assume that I might have or might not have uh, some positions on, on, on the assets that we will be uh, discussing today. Um, quickly, my background started uh, to work uh, as a prop trader or let's say a trader in 2000 in Paris um, on the long only product uh, which was doing uh, index uh, kind of arbitrage trying to to beat the, uh, the 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 French index the CAC 40 uh, then in 2004 uh, joined uh, Griffin Capital Management where I worked for four years uh, that was a hedge fund we were doing long only long short Eastern Europe and Western Europe uh, where I grew my uh, portfolio we had um, overall as a company three billion and uh, I was part of a team which was managing between half a billion to three quarters of a billion uh, euro. Um, on the other side, uh, in 2009, I started working for Infinity Capital Market as a prop trader. Uh, Capit uh, so Infinity is uh, the UK branch of First New York Securities, for those of you who uh, have heard about First New York. Um, um, and if from 2014 until now, I've been doing mentoring. Um, I work for another company. Um, then in 2018, I started my own mentoring program, my video series. Um, and uh, we started in January of this year, uh, working as a pop trader again for Infinity Capital, where I'm running a long, short book, um, no constraint in terms of assets, um, in terms of strategies, in terms of everything. Um, so today, what are we going to be uh, discussing? Uh, so we're going to be, as usual, looking about the situation across asset classes, uh, looking at the stocks, credit, commodities, and FX. There have been some significant moves um, across those asset classes, so they're interesting to, to discuss. Then we're going to be uh, talking about what happened yesterday with the, uh, the Fed meeting, which was uh, long uh, due, um, no real surprise, uh, but still it, it's worth uh, discussing. Uh, looking quickly at the Bank of England communication today, which was a bit of a, of a disaster um, or maybe a misunderstanding. Um, then we're going to be looking at the purchase uh, purchasing manager index uh, through the PMIs worldwide with the ISM as well in the US. And finally, uh, with the earning season. So many topics that we have been talking over and over, um, but uh, the market is, is, is more or less still the same. Uh, tomorrow we get the, the NFP numbers. Um, so far, we get uh, roughly 70% of the um, of the S&P 500 companies that uh, release their earnings. Um, at the end of this webinar, we're going to be looking at how they have been doing so far. Uh, we'll be discussing as well the seasonality of the S&P, uh, thinking how the, the, the market is usually doing. Uh, in terms of, of, um, of catalyst moving forward, again, two-thirds of the earnings season is, is, is done. Uh, we get the earnings season, um, then that is almost at the end. Uh, we get Thanksgiving in the US, um, which makes the, the timing around Thanksgiving pretty quiet uh, because literally the Americans go back home and the uh, market is very quiet from, from, the, from the Wednesday to, to the next Monday. Um, so uh, in terms of catalyst, we, we have a very important season for, for the retailers. Uh, so with, with the, uh, the, the Black Friday, the, the Cyber Monday, uh, still uh, extremely important. Um, and um, we've seen, if you've been doing, looking at the ISM manufacturing and the um, ISM services from yesterday, you can see that the retail uh, has been extremely strong in the US, um, still, you know, uh, ticking in the, in the top three uh, sectors. Uh, so um, very strong. Uh, 
um, we there are question marks of how the the the, re, um, the retail and the U.S. consumer uh, could carry on with the, the the prices of oil going up, uh, so gasoline going up. Um, so you, U.S. consumer confidence has been coming down a bit. Uh, so this is one of the um, of the questions that we'll be looking. The market has been extremely strong. Um, I'm talking the equity market. Um, I told you uh, a couple of weeks ago that I was uh, short the S&P a bit. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't work very well, um, to say the least. Um, there are some other positions that have been working, but this one um, has been pretty painful. A um, couple of weeks ago, we discussed the oil. Um, oil has been uh, breaking lower, the $80. Uh, dollar. Uh, we had today the, um, the OPEC meeting. Um, where for actually for quite a long time they kind of justify you know why they they are putting the supply uh, not in full stream just a way of, of answering the, the Biden administration normally they just don't care they just uh, do um, and give their quotas uh, meaning that um, um, literally they need a bit more to justify themselves uh, when oil is above 80. Um, I think, and again, if you haven't watched the, the webinar from, from a couple of weeks ago, um, normally um, there's everything should be better in the uh, starting in Q1 uh, 2022. So there is a call of, um, of you know, uh, oil being at, top, at the top. I think the 83, 85 um, is a good um, resistance level and you can be using a, a, a stop uh, with the, new, the the recent highs, um, just to close the position. So, asset classes performances um, picture is is more or less the same uh, from from a couple of weeks ago, um, but uh, with a bit of of difference, which is this part, which is the um, uh, developed market um, stocks uh, indexes um, are up more than twenty percent now. Um, they are up four or five percent over the, the the last month. More, I think it's six percent for for the S and P, roughly eight percent from the lows <clears throat> of um, October, which I have um, been telling you around 4300 that it looks like very much like uh, that was a, a potential uh, bottom. Having said that, I, I was thinking that the 4,500 um, was, was kind of, uh, it would be hard to be making new highs. And since then, the market has been making new highs. On the other hand of the spectrum, uh, China um, I, is, is still struggling, meaning emerging markets are struggling. Uh, we know that uh, China is going through a, a new lockdown. Um, if you watch the news, uh, if you talk to your friends in China, they are telling you the same picture, uh, which is China is closing. Um, the PMIs have been pretty poor. Uh, so there is a big question mark uh, still on the, the supply chain and the constraint on the supply chain. Uh, in terms of the currency, um, looking at the dollar, the dollar is still uh, pretty strong. Having said that, as we're going to be looking later, the euro dollar, um, euro is not making new lows. So um, I'm, I'm kind of indecisive now at the around the 115. Bitcoin above the 60, uh, the 60,000, the gold trading sideways and WTI again now below the 80. Let's look at the week to date asset performance. Um, so uh, the big winner has been the, the Russell 2000. So the small and, and mid caps, we're going to see later with the technical analysis, something that we discuss over and over, um, and that the, 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 the uh, sorry, the Russell 2000 was trading uh, in a trading range for quite a long time. Uh, now we have been breaking up this level. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, small and mid caps that have been pushing higher. Uh, this AMC, this JME of this world, um, for good or bad reasons. There is a lot of, of meme stories uh, which are helping the, this index. But overall, you can see uh, on the week to date that the world is, is divided uh, roughly in two, which is developed market. Uh, oops, it's even better like this. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to be putting the, the FTSE as an emerging market, but... Um, more or less the, between developed and, and, and emerging market. 
Uh, so developed markets are doing well, emerging markets are doing uh, not as well. Uh, only on the weekly picture, but that's overall the call. Um, currency is euro, um, uh, or should I say the dollar, flattish, and then we get uh, more volatility uh, for the other asset classes. Um, uh, so question for Justin, how is it important to look at the week to date? Um, I, I love to be uh, looking at the, the performances of, of asset classes um, over different time frames. So if you are active trader, you'll be obviously looking at the assets every single day, um, how they have been behaving, because, you know, when you're managing a portfolio, you get different asset classes in your book. And as well, there is arbitrage uh, for investors um, between asset classes. So you'll be looking every day. You can be looking every week. Uh, so if you are working, most of you, uh, most retail traders will have a, another job. And I think, you know, what they're going to be doing is at the end of the week, they'll be looking at the performance of stocks over the week. Um, and that's very true as well for many funds that uh, will be making decisions for the week in terms of uh, putting positions. Um, and then you look at the monthly, which make, gives you 20 days. You'll be looking at three months, six months, and the year to date. Uh, depends on your time frame, but that gives you a good understanding of, of, the, um, of the moves and the flows across asset classes and across uh, um, uh, sectors and, and, um, and industries. So if we look at the next slide, this is why we look at how uh, uh, the different sectors of the S&P, the 11 sectors of the S&P uh, have been doing year to date, which is, again, um, you can be taking year to date, five years, whatever. But reality is most uh, hedge funds, most uh, funds will be looking at the performance year to date. And that gives you a good indication of what uh, sectors have been underperforming or outperforming. The picture is, again, very similar to it, what it was a couple of weeks ago. On the week to date, um, uh, why uh, I want to look here at the week to date, because for instance, consumer discretionary is up 4.6%, okay? So consumer discretionary, if you look on, on uh, as a ticker, that will be XLY. And when we do the mentoring, we always try to understand, okay, what has been, mo been moving the XLY? Uh, so if you look at XLY, you go on, on uh, Yahoo Finance, you look at the members of the XLY and you will find out what, that the XLY is made by 20% from Amazon and guess what, 21.5% from Tesla. So what happened is obviously over the last month, Tesla went from 900 to uh, 12, uh, 1200 um, and is up 40, 35 to 40%. So if you take on the week on week, um, when um, Tesla is up 15% and makes 20% of the index, mechanically, uh, uh, consumer discretionary XLY is not performing the, uh, the overall uh, market. So this is why we like to look at performance. This is why we, because we're going to be able to generate ideas and to generate trades. Um, next slide. Uh, always we're looking at uh, other asset classes and the one that is that is bigger in terms of size than the equity market, which is the bond market. Uh, we are using the US as a proxy um, and, and looking at how the US 10 years has been moving year to date and week to date. Uh, so um, for quite a long time now, it, the US 10 years is moving between 140, 170. Uh, it, it's around 150, 155 as of today. Um, you can see that, um, uh, the, the, so here the yields have been a bit up. Uh, that was as of yesterday. Since then, actually yields have been coming down quite a lot today. So this picture is a bit misleading. Uh, it was as of today, but that tells you something interesting, which is actually the volatility of uh, the money market, volatility of bonds have been pretty uh, significant, uh, much higher than the volatility of the equity market. So the volatility of the equity market, which is not perfect, which is the VIX with the S&P 500, is at 15%, 16%, which is pretty low versus average uh, over time. And it's pretty low versus what happened recently. So on one hand, we get the equity market that is going up and up in declining volatility. 
And in the other hand, you do have a lot of volatility in the money market and in the bond market. So there is a lot of pain, a lot of, of, um, of volatility in the bond money market, very much less in the equity market. So equity market, uh, there are stories and we know why. I mean, if you've been following the, the, the several webinars that I've been doing, uh, we know that the equity market, especially in the US, has been very much driven by the calls, by the activity on options, uh, the option market, which is getting bigger and bigger. So actually, as we're going to see in one of the slides today, uh, the call options are now, or the options overall market is, uh, is overall uh, bigger than the underlying. So that tells you that really um, the, um, the leading indicator is the, are the options and um, the, the, the future or the underlying will be following. In terms of top winners and top losers, you're going to have the names that are making the headlines. We are talking about car here, uh, which went from 170 to 350, um, BBBY, um, Arista. So many of them were on earnings and, um, and revenues because obviously we are in the middle of the earnings season and the other end of the spectrum, you get some companies that um, came with bad earnings. So we can talk about Chegg. Uh, Zillow, uh, Zillow, there was been the story about their business model and the flipping of the houses that they are not stopping. Those are the names that actually uh, were the retail, uh, the retailers, the retail traders. So we were pretty long, those names. We are talking about Chegg and, and Zillow. Um, and we where the expectations were pretty high, where you, we were expecting the, the consensus was expecting 20% plus. Uh, sales for the next uh, couple of years. Uh, so if you were doing your screening in terms of quantitative analysis, very often those names will be uh, coming. Um, but as, as always, you know, it's not only the quantitative, you need to do the qualitative. Um, and there was some, so some red flags for, for, for some of those names. Um, next slide, um, something that I like to do from the index, we go into the sector, then we go into the industry and try, um, and that's a question that Justin, this is the same, trying to understand what has been moving over the last months and why I want to do that, why versus the last month, because if you look at the move that started on the S&P around 4,300, that was a month ago. So I try to understand, okay, what is, uh, what have been the leaders and the laggards of the S&P over that time, okay? So if you think that the market is overall seven, eight percent, so here, this is your benchmark. You want to know what are the leaders, okay? And what are the laggards, which are here? So as you can see, many industries um, have been doing less than the S&P, okay? So we are talking about uh, uh, many, many industries. And actually the big winners um, have been let's say concentrated in very, not very few, but not that many industries. So it tells you that the market breadth or um, how the, uh, the market is driven is by, uh, very, uh, by a very few names, okay? So solar is up 25%, consumer discretionary, as we discussed, the XLY is 17%, semiconductors, um, and guess what is semiconductors? We're going to be talking AMD. We're going to be talking NVIDIA, which is making a big chunk of it. Um, so think about the market that is really going up 7 10% based on 20% of the names. Yes, Kevin. Um, airline, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, that's a good point. I mean, Jets um, is down 6%. Um, so really, really struggling. You remember... Um, Kevin, because we discussed that at, at the start of the year, that was a market leader where there were all those memes, where all those names uh, were pushed, um, those, the, those names were pushed from 10 to 20, I can't remember which was UL or whatever, uh, but since then it has been, it has been struggling. So um, market driven by very few names and industries, uh, again, helps probably to do your ID generation. Um, quickly, in terms of um, after the, the, the market, um, uh, the market um, breadth, 
I like to put a few uh, a few charts that I found, you know, on Twitter or from 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 other sources. Uh, tells you here about uh, the the percentage of financial assets, uh, the equity allocation for, for for U.S. households, and that tells you about the wealth effect. Uh, that tells you that the uh, equity market is very important for the um, uh, U.S. consumer for the U.S. consumption. And uh, it kind of makes sense that neither the politicians nor the Fed uh, would like uh, the market to go uh, down too much because that will be obviously a, a big uh, problem for the um, balance sheet of the US households. Um, and that raised, raises the question with the market at this level, um, are we, could we, uh, that the retail traders um, and the retail overall are all in in the market? Uh, there is another confirmation here, uh, which is the, something that I discussed five minutes ago, which is the call squeeze. Uh, so here, this is the chart of the single stock options. Daily traded volumes were 1.4 times bigger than the underlying shares volumes in October 2021. So tell you again, over the last 12, 18 months, if you've been watching the webinars, I've been telling you over and over the option market is getting bigger and bigger. So for me, uh, with my background in equities, I've been more and more looking at options because I understand, I feel, I get that the market is more and more driven by options. So if you don't understand, you know, all those drivers, there is absolutely no chance that you're going to be making money. So if we look at this at this table, uh, which is the, the, the level of, of stock options versus the underlying, this is very similar to what is happening to Tesla and Nvidia uh, over the last month. So Tesla went from 900 to 1250, Nvidia from 200 to 310 today, um, and we're going to be looking at those at those charts later uh, during, when we do the, the technical an analysis. But what it means again is the, the market is driven by the op by options. Um, so if we take the example of the S&P, um, the, the market is driven by those options, either with a SPY, with the S&P, with names like Tesla and NVIDIA. And when I say options, it's call options, which are weekly, which are most of the time very short dated uh, from, you know, the one expiring this Friday and the, the one expiring next Friday. Um, before that, it used to be quarterly, it went from quarterly to monthly. Now it's literally weekly. And what happens, we have tons of calls that are bought every single day um, on the weekly and they're going from one name to another. So if you look today, that was mostly NVIDIA. So um, I strongly advise you, if you get the time after this call to be looking at the volume on calls today on NVIDIA. So we went from calls to 70, then to 275. So each time roughly you get 50,000 you know, options. Uh, call options that are traded at 275, then another 50,000 at 280, then another, and the stock, the stock goes up and follows the, the activity on the call options. Why? Because the, the market makers, the dealers need to hedge themselves. So 275, 280, 285, 290, 295, 300, 305, 310. And each time you're going to have, you know, 50,000, 60, 70,000 uh, call options. Uh, and if you think about it, you know, if the, the call option uh, costs, you know, four to five dollars, let's say five dollars, then you need to be buying 50,000 options. So 50 times five, that makes 250 times 100, that gives you 25 millions. So 25 millions to be moved, moving stock, you know, a market cap of 700 billion. Uh, where probably uh, some players have position of, of over than, than billion. Uh, we had over the weekend the same story with um, uh, this person in Singapore, which holds, you know, seven to 10 billion worth of Tesla, mostly with options. Imagine that you get 10 billion worth of, of, of Tesla. If it only costs you, you know, 25, 30 millions, you know, to be moving the underlying first and carries on and then everyone follows, you keep on doing it. So what happens is, is the market keeps on, on grinding um, pretty aggressively or less aggressively. So if you look at the S&P, um, the S&P almost every single day will finish at the end of the day at the, old, uh, at the new highs because the, of these options, uh, uh, the cold, this power of the calls um, 
meaning that on one hand, volatility has been dampened. And on the other hand, you know, the, the long calls are just making the market metrics grinding the market. So what could go wrong? <clears throat> you get, let's say, two to three um, um, things that could make these things a reset. So the first reset is obviously when those options are expiring, when they are expiring on the weekly, on the monthly or the quarterly. By definition, this is a reset of the positioning. Okay, so the market makers will restart with a, a new book, and they and they can be taking new position as long as we are into this phase of of of, of uh, uh, grinding and, and into the expiry, it goes up and up and up. So ex except expect a, re a reset when you get the expiry or when you get an external move, when you get an external shock, where the underlying moves big time. So if you look at the S&P 500 uh, with most options, you know what we call the gamma is gonna be, let's say around 45, 50, 40, 600, which is, you know, two to 3% below. Uh, so as long as you above this level, you know, market goes up. You need really the market either to gap down quite a lot, which is possible for stocks, okay? So stocks, you know, as long as Tesla is not going to be gapping down 5-10% one day with big volume, you know, it keeps on going up. And, and otherwise, you need an external shock when the market goes down during the day with uh, uh, where, the vol where the volume, where the, the market depths are going to be pretty empty and it goes down and down and suddenly the positioning of um, the long, the people long and the, the, the market makers has to, to flip, okay? But for the time being, what we have is the market that is grinding and not much uh, has been changing. Another chart um, table that I like, um, which is the S&P 500 seasonality. Uh, we discussed in September, you know, the risk of September being a tricky month, which happened October is normally a pretty good month as it happened. And November as well is a very good month. So, and then you could ask me, you know, why Greg are you short? And I'm like, I don't know why I'm short because, you know, seasonality is really going against me. Uh, so seasonality is telling you the market should go higher. But, you know, if I look now on Twitter, everyone is talking about seasonality. When everyone is talking about the same thing, it sounds a bit like you, you're close to the end. Everyone is talking about um, you're going to have a melt up. Um, that the market should go higher, that we're going to have to go to 4,800, 4, 5,000 before the end of the year, which sounds a bit, a bit too much. So now let's move into the um, technical analysis, um, the TA, uh, starting with the VIX. So um, as I told you before, the VIX now is around 15%. So actually was an, um, today was an interesting day again, where uh, you have the, the S&P up uh, 30 bips, 0.3%. And in the meantime, the, the, the VIX, the, the, the implied volatility going up. So that tells you the same story, which is, you know, you get tons of, of, um, of, of options play in the market with Tesla, with, with NVIDIA to them. And that is distorting uh, the, uh, the volatility of the S&P. Why? Because uh, uh, if the volatility of the big, uh, uh, stocks in the S&P, the, the implied volatility is moving up on the day. That is by definition impacting the implied volatility of the S&P as well. Um, next chart, uh, looking at the S&P, and today we're not going to be doing the futures uh, because I just want to try to comfort myself in <laughs> in being short. Um, so this is this is the chart. So up a bit of a chart. So the trend that, that, that started, let me kill that, that started um, during the election, the COVID is, is, is still ongoing. So it feels to me, and again, I'm wrong. So take everything with a pinch of salt. There is, no, there is no, um, nothing worse than a guy that is trying to, to sell your position. Um, so I think the upside, you know, is 47.30 from here. Uh, max, then you know it's going to be hard to, to go much much higher. But you can see the strengths of the move um, over the last uh, months, um, over the last 14 sessions, 12 of them were up, 
so that is that is quite significant. Uh, but again, the names that are driving uh, driving this this move are uh, uh, less and less. Uh, Nasdaq, -y, Nasdaq Composite, up making new highs. You see these truts, so um, cup and handle then, and you go higher and higher and higher. So this is, uh, it, it feels very much squeezy when you go into those, those uh, parabolic moves. Um, other one that we discussed before, which is the, uh, uh, the, the Russell. Um, so here we are using the ETF. Again, since, uh, since February, March, we have been talking about every session we've been discussing this, uh, this, um, this corridor. Uh, now it has been breaking higher. So it's up 2% since then. Um, that is being driven by some, some maybe some dodgy names, but uh, that is what the price action is telling you, pretty strong. Um, and, and normally um, there is a chance that there's going to be follow up uh, going into uh, the end of the year. Um, Want to do a bit of Europe with the um, stock 600. Uh, stock 600, same thing, it looks very much like uh, the other chart where we are making, so let me add this one, uh, breaking, making new highs. Um, actually, what was interesting today in Europe is the, uh, the, the banks were pretty weakish, uh, which makes sense because the, the, the bonds, uh, the bonds rallied, so the yields came, came down. So you have a lot of charts like, um, like BNP, uh, for instance, which uh, uh, have been uh, breaking um, uh, higher. So this is BNP, the, 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 the French bank breaking higher. Um, it, I think it's basing now. Question for most uh, of, of those uh, banking stocks is, you know, uh, can we uh, do a, a move higher? Um, then the next one in terms of, of um, indexes, uh, the Philadelphia. Um, so that's for semiconductors has been breaking. Uh, so I tweeted a couple of days ago, uh, so it broke this, this um, um, same thing, this um, channel that we had since March, um, driven by, by the same names, uh, which are AMD and NVIDIA mostly. Uh, so it's, it's making new highs. Um, it, those are incredible big moves. If you think in terms of percentage term, we are talking uh, uh, literally uh, six, seven percent in a week time. So very, very strong move. If we go now into the single names, um, Tesla, uh, just to make a bit of, of noise. Um, so uh, after the, the breakout of the, the cup and handle, we literally went from 900 to more than, 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 than 1200. So Huge move, um, feels like uh, many traders are, are doing the same, which is chasing those names and chasing the, those breakouts. Um, but um, the, the, the something that we discussed before, which is the XLY, um, where Tesla is making 20%, broke the 185, now at around 210. Yeah, I know, Kevin, if I had bought uh, Tesla, I could have retired now. I know, if you think about it, if you bought like Tesla for $100,000 like, uh, like a month ago, you could, you could buy um, a Tesla brand new uh, today. Um, but um, I think, you know, to do all those things, you need to be in your 20s. And, and when I started, I was like this. I didn't think I was just looking at the price action and I was buying and selling, you know, just on the price action. Now I'm thinking too much and that's probably why I need... I need new people now around me, uh, young people to trade uh, because that makes the, uh, um, uh, the the double thinking less important. But um, if you think that Tesla is going to come back, if you think that there is a bit too much, um, you don't have necessarily to play with Tesla. Uh, this is a very similar trade that I did with GME uh, at the start of the year with the ETF. So XLY, Tesla is big. Here I'm looking at a strategy, which is a put spread at 210, 185, uh, where uh, you could check uh, with the prices at, uh, at the end of the day, today, Thursday, where it's going to cost you the 210 is 6.8, uh, the 185, you're going to get 145. So overall, the cost is 440.55. The max payoff, you know, the blue sky scenario, you're going to be making 25 minus the cost of the option, which is 20.45. And for risk reward of 4.5. So not bad. Obviously, what you need to have 
uh, what you're betting on is um, XLY to come back to come back here. Um, that's like any position, you know, it's, is it possible or not? But at least here you have a good risk reward for something to come back to revert to the mean. Um, XRT um, breakout, similar boom. That is the breakout. So those are the chart. Um, interesting one, another one, Exxon Mobile, close to breaking higher as well. So that has been uh, trading below this resistance that has been for quite a long time. So name to watch. Um, some of my mentees looking at Facebook. So Facebook, the chart, this is the chart. So now uh, still trading below this, this, this range. Uh, Facebook, or should I say the metaverse? Um, so this is one to monitor because uh, has been pretty weak uh, in, in the space. Uh, another name, check that has been destroyed, uh, which uh, gives you um, good classic technical analysis with head and shoulder. You get the shoulder, the head, the shoulder, and then boom. And probably, you know, the support is... is you know, 30 or lower, um, but the big move has been done uh, now. Uh, another one that uh, many retail traders look at, which is Zillow. Um, so uh, interesting one, I look at it like a couple of weeks ago and actually I almost get caught. Uh, so there was a fake here. And then since then uh, came down quite a lot. Uh, it's on the support now um, around this uh, 66 level. Um, on one hand, you can argue that um, they cut their uh, losing position, which was their flipping businesses. On the other hand, that tells you that the uh, expectations of growth for the next two to three years will have to come down massively. Uh, so there's a reset of the business model. Uh, so there's a lot of, of question mark. Um, I'm going to do a bit of, of dodgy stories. Uh, GME, so actually GME, you can see the, the meme stocks uh, there was a lot of expectation yesterday and actually there was a lot of fake. So um, again, uh, AMC, GME, the, the, those mean stocks have been coming down uh, uh, from yesterday's high. Uh, and, and yesterday price action was, was pretty weak. And finally, for the stocks, we're going to end up with NVIDIA because NVIDIA uh, is really the, the story of the day. Uh, since the, 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 the breakout at 230, something has been on a tier. So that's the um, second derivative of the, the metaverse um, story, the Facebook, whatever. And the stock has been extremely, extremely strong. That is a 700 billion market cap now. Um, it looks, all those things looks pretty extended, but um, with, with, with stocks, uh, from my little experience, I know that uh, what is extended could be even more extended. Uh, they're gonna have their earnings pretty soon. Uh, so that those are, <clears throat> sorry, four stocks. Uh, quickly, uh, looking at uh, the oil market, uh, because I have some shit positions, but I have some positions that are working a bit. Um, we discussed oil uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I told you that there was a chance that we uh, uh, we are we are making at least uh, uh, intermediate highs. <laughs> uh, so we didn't make new highs, which is always a positive. So lower highs um, feels that you know uh, now if you've been short uh, around the 83, 84, you can be using this uh, this stop around this 85, 50 uh, should come down. Most uh, actually majors, all majors in Europe um, have been down five, ten percent from the highs. So that is that is one good trade. Um, something else that I wanted to discuss doing through uh, currencies. So sterling. So today sterling uh, complete cheat show um, from the Bank of England. Um, not a shit show because, you know, I should, I should uh, respect them, but um, it's, it's just that the communication was absolutely awful. Um, people who, uh, and market participants get completely lost. So uh, quite a weakish um, uh, uh, sterling. And, and if we look at the euro dollar, so as I told you since, since Jan, um, I've been <clears throat> pretty uh, bullish the dollar, so the dollar has been putting pretty well. Uh, here I have a question mark, uh, so maybe some of you can, can help me later. Which is the uh, the euro is is um, is not making euros. Okay, so um, 
I, I would love uh, to see uh, going uh, below the 115, but um, um, I'm, I'm a bit concerned now that everyone is saying that the dollar should get stronger. So the risk reward is, is not as good as it was uh, above the 120. Uh, now it's, it's a 50-50. Uh, so I will be using a, a, a tighter stop loss. Um, so let's go back. Um, so I hope this technical analysis helps you a lot. I'm not, um, I'm not a star of technical analysis. I'm just trying, you know, to find some, some risk reward and and some level. So next slide, um, going into the central bank's balance sheet. So this is the same slide as a couple of weeks ago, but always worth putting it back, uh, which tells you. Um, about how the central banks are putting tons of liquidity in the system. So that's always something to keep in mind, especially if you're short like me. Um, Fed expectations. So here we are looking at the euro dollar futures. Uh, so from a couple of weeks ago uh, until today. Um, so um, euro dollar tells you how the Fed uh, or the market participants are expected the Fed to be moving rates in the future. So if we look at the December 2022 uh, versus today, we, the market is pricing these days uh, a differential of 58 bips, which more or less tells you that in uh, over the next 12 months, um, we are expected the Fed to hike rates twice by 25 bips which is a bit more than what it was a couple of weeks ago. And if you look at December 2023, so the next two years, we are talking 120, which is more or less the same as uh, it was um, um, a couple of weeks ago. So what the Fed said yesterday is they're going to be tapering. Uh, that was usually expected. They're going to be starting to taper from this month uh, by 15 billion. Um, out of the 100, 120 billion, meaning that um, if you if you use um, 15 every every month or from every six weeks, uh, probably you're gonna end up around June uh, with the end of the QE. They said as always that they are market depend uh, um, uh, data dependent, uh, which is always a funny thing because if you remember correctly, in May or June, I think it was in June, they said they are market. Data dependent, but don't worry, inflation will going to be coming back in fall. So we are expecting inflation to come down quite massively in October, November. So six months later, inflation is still at the same level. And now they are telling you, oh, this is the supply chain, the bottlenecks, the blah, 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 blah. And there is always a good reason, but bottom line is, is, is inflation is still there. So there is a big question mark now of, you know, the credibility of the Fed and if the Fed uh, could be late uh, in fighting inflation. So uh, there was an interesting uh, interview today um, from Yardeni saying, you know, what the Fed could do actually next year is instead of targeting 2%, is, is targeting 3%. Uh, because if in a world where you get tons of debt, you need inflation to pay back. <clears throat> So you don't want inflation to be at 1%, you want inflation to be at 2 to 3%. Um, so is the Fed really willing on, uh, on uh, cutting uh, inflation? I think there is a big question mark here. Uh, I hear about the bottlenecks and, and, and the, the supply chain issues and the world is reopening. But uh, in terms of credibility, uh, that, that, that there are some problems here. Uh, so Fed expectations here, uh, top hand, we are looking at the 10 years versus the two years and the bottom, the third years versus the 10 years. Uh, so this is the steepening or the flattening of the yield curve. If you look at the 30 years versus the 10 years, what has been happening is it has been coming down. So there has been a flattening of the long hand, uh, end of the curve, which actually <clears throat> has been quite poor, uh, 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 quite um, um, damageful for many, for some uh, macro traders. Uh, so you've seen probably the headlines of some hedge funds down 20%, 10%, 5%. So there is a lot of, of pain in the uh, bond market, in the money market, um, which actually uh, um, for us in the equity market is is the volatility that we we trade on the um, on a daily uh, basis but actually if you think about the sizes of those uh, guys we are talking huge sizes so the pain is is, is pretty significant um, um so this is really a, a, a space 
uh, to keep on, on, on monitoring. The, again, there has been a flattening of the yield curve, uh, <clears throat> which is more or less telling you it's not necessarily, uh, probably market is really pricing inflation spiking now. In the long run, are we gonna have significant growth? Probably not. Uh, and are we gonna have huge inflation? Probably not as well. Um, <clears throat> so finally, in, in terms of, um, of central banks, uh, Bank of England today for the UK viewers and for anyone. Uh, so this is here, the, the short sterling or the BOE expectations move for December, uh, something that we discussed during the last webinar. So uh, the market suddenly uh, from mid-September expected um, the, the Bank of England uh, to hike rates quite aggressively, uh, roughly 40, 50 bips uh, in December. And today the Bank of England said, no, we off, we don't do much. Why? Because the UK economy is slowing and it's we are data dependent. So we're going to see later. So you see this big move today. So there is quest, really a big question mark today um, around, you know, where uh, market participants in the uh, uh, money market just freaking out out of nothing. Or um, was the, the, the Bank of England communication very, very bad? Um, and, and, and that tells you the risk of um, central bankers uh, miscommunicating or, or communicating badly about um, um, what's going to be the next move. So uh, if you think about the Bank of England uh, versus the, the Fed, obviously, um, no offense to them, this, they are quite midget, uh, but that tells you that the Fed needs to be extremely careful of how they're going to communicate to the market. And because uh, the implications are obviously massive, especially after 18 months of huge uh, uh, dovishness, uh, huge uh, uh, um, liquidity in the system through QE and through um, uh, yields at zero. So um, <clears throat> um, listening to, to Powell yesterday, I'm not a macro guy, I'm not a specialist of those things, but I'm, I was not very convinced. Um, as long as the Fed is the biggest um, uh, player in, the, in town and they are the, the whale in the market and they are driving and, and making kind, uh, pretending that there is a money market market um, and there is a, a bond market, that is fine. But if the beast wakens at one stage, uh, then we are in for a big trouble. So next slide. PMIs, uh, so here um, the source is market. We are looking at the global PMIs, the global in, in blue. Uh, we are looking at the US, US on China, Japan and the UK. So the picture is more or less the same, which we wish to pick. Oh, sorry, oh, I should be doing this one. Can I do, can I do, okay, pen up. No, don't want, let's go back. My pen, okay, so top around May, June. And we know that the economy is picked in May, June. Since then, we have been coming down a bit. Um, China uh, struggling uh, around the 50%. Um, we know that the Chinese economy is struggling. And, and US, UK, Eurozone coming from a high level. So question now is, do we go there or we go down a bit more? Uh, so that's for the global PMIs. The ISM manufacturing, so that is for the US, the picture is more or less the same, which is a pretty, pretty strong number. Uh, the new orders have been coming down for the last report and the prices are still very high. So the picture is more or less the same. The ISM services, so I've been using uh, since 1997, as you can see, all time high for ISM services, new orders, all time high, prices very high. So. Um, is the is the the Fed are the central banks creating a way too hot economy? If inflation clearly, um, it feels like the the Fed could be could be late, um, and 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 that tells you that there is no risk going into into twenty twenty two. Again, take all of this with a bit of pinch of salt because I'm a bit talking uh, uh, my book here. <laughs> Um, earning season, 
quickly. So uh, this is uh, very much the same slides as a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the, the only difference is obviously the, the, the this table that uh, is now updated. So we had 421 uh, companies out of the 500 S&P 500 companies that have now reported. Out of this 421, 283, so that's here, have been beating expectations on the top line. So 67%, which is a good number, but that is very much less so than it was in Q2 2021, which was 87% and Q1 2020. So one of the reasons I was short and I'm still short is I still want to believe that uh, the earnings season is okay in terms of earnings, which are 82% here, 82% beat, but the top line are weaker than, than, than the previous quarters. So in, in the long run, uh, top line really matters. Uh, if, you, uh, if your top line growth is, is not as good as before, that's uh, based on the operating leverage, your earnings growth is gonna come down. So uh, it feels to me like now we are at peak um, and same with the operating margins. And as we are going almost into 2022, um, there is a risk that the numbers could come down. I'm with you and with many uh, market participants that um, the seasonality is against me and that there are many things that are breaking out, but um, uh, maybe it's, it's short-term pain for long-term gain. Um, earning season, so here, this is a slide, uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, a chart or a table from JP Morgan. So where you can see here, this is the one where um, during this uh, Q3 earnings season, uh, the companies that have been missing expectations, uh, missing EPS and, and, and revenues have been penalized quite a lot. Okay, so um, if you look over the last five years, uh, during this season, minus 3.2% if you were missing the, uh, the EPS. And this is why you have those huge moves of names like Shag, names like Zillow, where uh, stocks literally go down 30, 50%. So if you look at Shag, it was down 40%, then, you know, there is earnings uh, uh, follow-up. So if you miss, if you've been missing uh, um, uh, EPS, or revenues that has been, you have been uh, massively uh, penalized by the market. Um, and actually, if you've been, um, as you've seen a couple of weeks ago, if you've been doing in line numbers or beating the expectations, the stock will be moving more or less uh, like the S&P. So again, to me, this market is driven by what is driven by very few names and is driven mostly by call options on those very few names. So it's, it's as long as we get these, these, these options, you know, and, and people in the money and no margin calls, the market go up. But fundamentally, when I see these headlines about, you know, earnings season has been brilliant, all those names have been doing very well. I disagree. The, the facts are going against it. Um, so Kevin, to come back to your question, what about missing revenues? That is more or less the same. If you miss on revenues or EPS, you have been uh, um, penalized uh, quite a lot. Um, next slide. Um, so this is the uh, uh, from um, Deutsche Bank and from Bloomberg, which tells you about the size of the bit. Uh, and how the S&P aggregate earnings bit have been doing. So uh, the bit over the, we know that over the last four quarters, there have been quite a significant bit from companies. Most of the time EPS have been beating by 80, 85%. If you think about the, the, the standard historically, I think it's 65%. So pretty strong, um, but there is a good chance now that we're gonna have um, correction or reversion to the mean. So um, what has been happening over the last four quarters, five quarters, uh, we could say that moving forward, we're going to have some normalization. Um, so this is here, this is not necessarily about talking about my book, uh, but this is really factual. Um, <clears throat> there is a, a chance that uh, first thing first, that earnings growth are not going to be as strong as before and the surprises will come down. On a positive note, 
um, to explain what has been the, the move of the S&P this year. So when we started the year, uh, we had much lower uh, uh, earnings expectation. Uh, we're going to end up the year at $200 operating uh, uh, EPS for the S&P, which is, which is quite a lot. Uh, so the move of the S&P has been mostly coming from the earnings growth um, and not by uh, uh, earnings expansion or the PE expansion. So PE have been coming down. So that's for the S&P where earnings have been very, very strong. So you could argue that if you be taking the same PE as the start of the year, we should be a, a bit higher. Um, there is a case as well that you can justify this <clears throat> by the fact that um, versus 12 months ago, yields are expected to be higher than it was than they were 12 months ago. So that means the risk premium uh, is different. Uh, so instead of paying 25 times, you could be paying 23 times. Um, but that is um, uh, another way of telling you that um, um, the S&P 500 has been very strong for some good reason, which is the earnings growth, okay? Uh, earnings growth have been very strong. And it's not like some other years where, uh, for instance, I think it was 2019, where the earnings growth was uh, only 5%, but in the meantime, the market rallied 20%. Why? Because we had PE expansion. So instead of paying 20 times earnings, we were paying 22, 23, 24 times earnings. Um, so uh, 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 those, multiple, those multiples, you know, either you get the earnings that are growing or uh, you get P ex ex expansion. Um, so good thing is we had earnings um, uh, growth, uh, really good earnings growth for, for in, in 2021. Expectations for 2022 are for 10% earnings growth, which is very similar to the average over, over time, which is 7, 10% for the, for the S&P. But that tells you that things should normalize going forward, um, especially to me, as I've been saying again over the last two sessions, which is the sales of the S&P, uh, at least for the S&P 500, have not going to be uh, beaten as much as they used to. Uh, for the small and mid caps, this is a bit less true. So small and mid caps have been doing better. So if you think about the overall picture, when you look, when you long the S&P versus, uh, uh, versus the Russell 2000, you long more uh, um, international than you long the US, okay? When you long um, um, Russell, you more uh, long um, US consumer. So the, you can argue that the US economy has been doing better than the, uh, uh, the, the rest of the world recently. So this is why maybe, um, the Russell has been outperforming uh, the S&P 500. I hope it makes sense. Um, next slide, quickly, uh, what I can offer, where I can help you. Um, I got three things where I think I can help you, which is the trading community. So bringing IDs uh, every day, I need, I uh, want, and I'm active. I try to put IDs and, and, and you know, Calls for the day uh, where I see uh, special situations, where I see things that are interesting. Um, we are uh, almost 80 people, 80 traders. Um, so it's, it's, it's slowly growing. Uh, the second point is the four by four video series, uh, something that I built a couple of years ago based on my 20 years experience as a hedge fund manager, prop trader, and as well as, um, as a mentor since 2014, I used to work for another company. I knew where people were struggling, uh, where they were misled. So uh, that is the four by four video series. And then the mentoring, which is a one-on-one -on -one session uh, through Zoom or Skype, where together we try uh, to uh, get an investment process, try to generate ideas and try obviously to build a portfolio together. Uh, so with real money, with your real money, that works very well. Uh, I enjoyed that very much. Um, and I have many mentees. Um, I probably got almost 100 mentees over the last, uh, since 2014. So if you get questions um, about today, if you get questions about where I can help you, if you get questions about, you know, something that is market, um, 
Michel, you're asking about how can I get into hedge fund if I already have a good track record. Um, so how can you uh, get into a hedge fund? So uh, Michel, that is, that is a fair question. I think the, um, for a track record, a track record works better for prop trading than actually it works for a hedge fund. So hedge fund, there is more politics than there is for uh, prop trading. Prop trading, it's all about your track record. Hedge fund, you know, there's a bit of, you know, you know the guy that is there, it finds you a place. Um, having said that, track record will help. Um, as long as you get um, a, a liquid portfolio with no crazy uh, um, 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 downtimes where um, your concentration is limited. So make sure that actually um, it's not only the headline number that looks good, but uh, the overall strategies that uh, are making you money across um, across assets or across uh, the different strategies. Um, otherwise, to cont hedge funds are very fragmented, so it's pretty hard because you need to go from door to door. And there are some um, some some let's say um, how you say that sorry yeah, some communities that help you uh, with uh, with jobs with internship from my experience you know starting with an internship or saying you know uh, coming to people and saying to them i don't know much but i'm here to help uh, i think what is clear these days is if you want to work in a hedge fund you need to do a bit of coding even if it sounds a bit cliche and um, first thing first is, is coding so michel please send me an email i'm happy to talk to you uh, and help you uh, on this of how to move uh, to move forward uh, maybe i could have uh, some better ideas um I hope you enjoyed today. Uh, market is is very squeezy. Um, I'm wrong on the s and P. I've been right on some other things. So overall, you know, performance is is not um, is is flattish um, for too long now. So I'm a bit frustrated. Um, I hope you are doing better than me. Um, I don't think this is that that complicated. Um, and I hope those, those, those webinars help you. It helps me a lot. Um, questions, you contact me. Um, and for those of you who are on the community, uh, please share your ideas. That will be an even better uh, thing. Thank you very much. Talk to you, uh, maybe not in two weeks. Uh, is it going to be Thanksgiving? No, it's Thanksgiving in three weeks, I think. Uh, so maybe in two weeks, um, probably in two weeks. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much and talk to you soon, all of you. Bye-bye.